Okay, today what we want to do is finish up the material talking about fiscal policy and uh, then we'll be ready for an exam to cover this Keynesian economic model and fiscal policy. Uh, what we were doing last time, let me sort of go back and set the scene so that it's all familiar to you. The Keynesian model of the economy has got a total production curve, which is, this is the 45 degree line. There's a total expenditure curve, which you'll remember, total expenditures equals consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. This is autonomous spending. I'll call that A1. We're very interested in that autonomous spending because it's through this amount, autonomous consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports minus MPC times taxes. These are personal taxes that we're talking about. That's what that A1 is. On, a, on test day, what I'll do is I'll give you values for these. Uh, why don't I give you a few values right now and then we'll just do a quick calculation for fun. Let's say the slope of this curve, which is equal to the MPC, uh, is equal to, uh, I can't remember what I've used before. Let's use point, point 0.9. I don't think I've used that before. We'll assume consumption's 50, investment 20, government spending 30, net exports minus 10, the MPC I just said is 0.9, and let's say taxes are, um, hmm, what would be a good amount, 20. So what do we have? 70, 100, 90, we're up to 90 here, and then this is minus 18, which is 72. My math right? 50, 70, 100, 90, yeah, I think it is. Okay, so what we have here is $72, that's autonomous consumption, consumption spending. Equilibrium income, QE, equals autonomous consumption spending times 1 over 1 minus the MPC, which this thing in parentheses is our multiplier. This is equal to $72 times 10, 1 over 1 minus 0.9 is equal 1 over 0.1, which is equal to 10, equals 720. And what I'm saying to you is this amount right here is 720. That's the equilibrium level of GDP. Okay. We can carry out various sort of government policies, fiscal policies. If we add 10 to government expenditures, let me get a little bit different color here to mark this off. If we add 10 to government expenditures, this curve shifts up, the total expenditures curve shifts upward by $10 to 82. Equilibrium income is how much? You ought to be able to do it in your head. Here's a shift in autonomous spending is $10. We've got a multiplier of 10, so this is 820. Equilibrium GDP went up by 10 times the change in government spending. Or we can multiply 82 times 10 and we get 820. Okay. Suppose instead, let's try something a little bit different. Suppose instead of, uh, of increasing government spending, what we did is we increased taxes. Let's increase taxes $10. Okay. Um, increase taxes $10, then this would go from 20 to 30. 0.9 times 30 is 27. Oh boy, I don't know what's the easiest way to demonstrate this. Um, it was, well, it's gone up by nine. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it has. We were at $18. Boy, there is so much on the board here. Here's what we did have. This uh, tax component was the marginal propensity to consume 90% of previously 20. So this was an $18, which was negative. It was taking away from spending. When you tax people, they have less money, they spend less. So anyway, this was a negative 18 to begin with. And now it's 0.9 times 30 with a negative, so this is negative 27. Was well, negative 18, now it's negative 27. That is to say, the tax component is now <coughs> shifting downward. We've gone, 
we were having taxes depressed spending by $18. Now they're depressing spending by $27. So the net amount is taxes are going to depress spending by $9, minus 9. Autonomous spending is going to go back down from 82 down to, what's 9 less than that, 73. I don't know if it was easier to show this some other way or not, but because I've really got two policies in here. I increase government spending by $10. G increase 10. I increase taxes by $10. By the way, this is called a balanced budget fiscal policy, increase G by 10, increase T by 10. I don't mean to say we have a balanced budget. I mean this new policy that I'm talking about where we are changing government spending and changing taxes at the same time, same amount, same direction. In terms of whatever the budget was to begin with, it has not changed. If the budget was previously balanced, it still is balanced. If the budget was previously in deficit by $20, it still is in deficit $20 because taxes and government spending have changed by equal amounts. Here's what we've seen, is that when government spending went up by $10, the autonomous spending curve shifted up. Here's the autonomous spending from 72 up to 82. That's the $10. But what we've also seen is when taxes went up by $10, autonomous spending went down by 9 Why is that a smaller amount? Well, the answer is this, is that when we came along and spent, not we, but the government, when the government came along and spent $10 to begin with, that $10 went directly into total spending. That's the end of the story. $10 more of total spending. But when the government came along with its tax increase and said, we're going to tax you another $10, that, didn't come out, uh, that wasn't a $10 deduction in, in spending, and here's why. When they came to me and they said, hey, Tom, it's time for you to pay an extra $10 in taxes, I say, okay, well, my MPC is 90%, so my disposable income has now gone down by $10. And when my disposable income goes down by $10 to pay the taxes, I'm going to reduce my consumption spending by 90% of the $10, by $9. So there's a reduction in autonomous spending by $9. Where's that other $1 come from? That is to say, if my tax bill went up by $10 and I reduce my spending by 9 which is what we're talking about here, where do I get the other dollar to pay my taxes? And the answer is, it comes out of my saving. And so it's the, the fact that I take some of that money out of saving that means that uh, really what it means is that the government spending increase is more powerful. It shifts the curve by $10. More powerful than the tax increase, it only shifts the curve by 9 And we can see that right here. That's what this MPC is here for, is to tell us mm, the tax change is only partly, in this case 90%, passed through as a reduction in spending, but 10% of it is a reduction in saving. And that wasn't going to be money spent anyway, and that being the case, it didn't take away from aggregate demand, or total expenditures, I should say. Anyway, let me go over here and see if I can write something down that makes sense out of all of this. We have a balanced budget theorem. Oh, did I ever work out the final equilibrium? I don't think I did. $730, there we go. Balanced budget theorem says this. If G and T increase by equal amounts, for example, $10, real GDP will increase by the same amount. That is to say, $10. And then we could go in there and put in the word decrease where it says increase right now. If G and T decrease by, oh, excuse me, equal amounts, then GDP will decrease by that same amount.
That is to say, there's a balanced budget multiplier of one. Multiplier, oh, I'll say BB multiplier equal one. And again, the thinking behind that, let me see if I can represent this. Change in Q is equal to change in G, government spending, purchases, I should say, government purchase, times 1 over 1 minus the MPC. With respect to taxes, change in Q equals change in taxes times the MPC times 1 over 1 minus the MPC. And it's this thing right in here, this MPC. Oh, I'm sorry, there should be a negative sign here. It's that MPC in there that causes. Oh, let's see if we can't come up with a tax multiplier and a government spending multiplier. Here's the government spending multiplier. And I think I've said it before, but I'll just remind you, we could have also written this as 1 over the marginal propensity to save, since 1 minus the MPC is a marginal propensity to save. Here's the tax multiplier. Uh, how do I want to write this down? Let me shift my negative sign over here. So here's my government spending multiplier. One over the marginal propensity to save. Here it is for my tax multiplier. It's the MPC over the MPS with a negative sign out in front of it. And the government spending multiplier is simply bigger than the tax multiplier. And why is that? Again, the reason is just what I mentioned a moment ago. If my taxes go up by $10, I see that as a reduction in disposable income. So I lower my consumption spending by the MPC times $10. Here it's $9. And so there's $9 taken out of autonomous spending, but not the same amount as went into autonomous spending when the government increased spending by 10 bucks. So anyway, balance budget multiplier equal to 1. You don't have to be able to write a whole dissertation about this or do all the formulas, but it would be good if you would be familiar with this. By the way, here's kind of a neat relationship that may help you remember this. We've got two multipliers. Here's the, let me put an M for the multiplier with a G. Here's the government spending multiplier. Here's the tax multiplier. Okay, here's how I can remember these pretty easily. If the government spending multiplier is, in this case, 10, we had an MPC of 0.9, wherever that was, then the, gov the tax multiplier is going to be one smaller than 10, which is 9, always one smaller, with a negative sign out front. One smaller than 1 over MPS. And so let me give you another example. See if you can't just do this one in your head. Let's say I tell you the MPC is equal to 0.75. Here's what you should say. The government spending multiplier is equal to 4. And the tax multiplier is equal to, here's our negative sign. It's always going to be there for a tax multiplier. But it's going to be one unit smaller than 4, which is 3. Another one, let's say the MPC is 0.8. The government spending multiplier is going to be 5. The tax multiplier is going to be, put a negative sign out there, but then just reduce 5 by 1, 4. I had to stop there for a second. I think I was going to get that wrong. Any questions about this? Here's what you want to do before test day. You want to work a few of these problems. And that's why I've tried to, the last few class periods, come in and start off by working a problem. You want to be comfortable with this because on test day, you're for sure going to have to do some of these calculations. And you don't want to stop right then and say, oh, yeah, that's in my notes someplace. Just have it automatic. And like this thing I'm doing right here by just reducing the government spend a multiplier by 1 and then putting a negative sign out, it doesn't take you forever. And gee, balance budget multiplier, look at this. We've got a government spending multiplier of 5, a tax multiplier of minus 4. The difference between those is 1. There's our balance budget multiplier of 1.
Okay, any questions about that? That's the type of problems then that we will be calculating uh, for exam day, for test day. Okay, what we want to do to, um, and by the way, you understand the idea, I put it up last time, but the idea is this. If, go, if the equilibrium level of GDP is low, let's say it's right here at 720, and full employment is over here at 900, then the idea of the Keynesian model is, how are we going to get equilibrium GDP up to, um, up to 900? And the answer is, somehow or another, we have to shift this total expenditures curve up so that it passes through the total production curve at 900. I wonder what this would have to be right here. What would autonomous spending have to be in order to get equilibrium GDP at 900? Anybody? 90. Exactly, 90. Okay, so anyway, and, and that would be then what? From our original position, what do we have? $72, that would be an $18 increase in autonomous spending that would be required. And how do we get autonomous spending to go up by $18? One way would be increase government spending by $18. Alright? So anyway, um, let's go on. We've kind of got the positive side of this whole Keynesian model. What's the negative side? And the negative side is this. It's not always as effective as it's supposed to be. And this was real easy to just come over here and go, oh yeah, all we have to do is increase autonomous spending from 72 to 90, and then we have equilibrium GDP at full employment, and the world's a better place to live in. Uh, that's kind of an easy thing to say, but it's not so easy to do in reality because there are certain things that makes fiscal policy less powerful, less effective than the Keynesian model, the simple Keynesian model, um, makes it out to be. Here's the first thing, uh, well, limitations, let's call them, on Keynesian fiscal policy. One, the aggregate supply curve, let's say short run aggregate supply curve, has a positive slope. I'll just stick with these numbers that we were working with a moment ago here and to say, uh, okay, suppose real GD uh, natural real GDP is $900. That's when we have full employment. We shift autonomous spending up from $72 to $90. The equilibrium GDP goes from $720 to $900. That's exactly what we want, success. And so we come over here, we draw our aggregate demand curve. It's shifted to the right by $180. Isn't that right? Yeah. Equilibrium GDP is at 900, the world is a better place to live. Well, just a second. What if the aggregate supply curve looks like this? Upward sloping. Then we get the aggregate demand curve shift, but we don't actually move all the way out to, e uh, to natural real GDP because some of that increase in spending, and that's what we're talking about here at the uh, aggregate demand, some of that increase in spending didn't work its way into creating more jobs and more real production. Some of that increase in spending just caused the price level to go up. We had inflation. Keynes didn't count on inflation because he was riding during a depression period. Okay? But anyway, the point is, is that one limitation of this fiscal policy, why doesn't it work as well as it, it does in the, on the, the blackboard? And the answer is, there's other stuff going on other than stable prices. A second thing that causes um, this Keynesian fiscal policy to be less effective than it might otherwise be is something called crowding out. You've heard of crowding into line. Well, this is crowding out. Here's the idea of crowding out. It says basically this, increase government spending. And that's what we were talking about just a moment ago to, to get total expenditures up and increase uh, GDP. Increase government spending, according to this crowding out analysis. Increase government spending causes private spending to go down. 
the government spends more, private individuals spend less. And so the curve shifts upward, the government comes along and spends $18, the total expenditures curve shifts upward by $18, and then private spending, like consumption and investment, that starts going down, and so the curve shifts downward. And we don't get that full impact on aggregate demand or on total expenditures. Let me do it this way, increase in G, decrease in C, and decrease in I. That's what we mean by crowding out. What causes that? Well, there's different kinds of crowding out. There's what you could call a direct crowding out, CO crowding out. Here's a direct crowding out. It's something like this. If the government builds a library and lends books out for free, then people say, hey, now I don't need to buy books. I'll go to the library and get them for free. And so book purchases out at the Barnes & Noble or you know, wherever the bookstores are, book purchases go down, Amazon.com. Um, if the government builds a highway, then the private sector doesn't build a turnpike. Increase in government spending for highways, decrease in, government, uh, in private spending for turnpikes. You get the idea. There are a number of these things. Healthcare services, if the government comes around and gives you shots, you know, for uh, immunize you against uh, the flu or whatever, then you're less likely to go out and pay a doctor to give you that same kind of shot. When the government spends the money, then we individuals say we don't need to as much. Okay? And um, how about another kind of crowding out, which is really indirect? CO crowding out, uh, and that is caused through changes in interest rates. Uh, and this uh, occurs with deficit spending. Here's the story on this one. Let me, I better get up here and sort of make some symbols to make this clear. Increase in G and no change in T, that results in an increase in the government's deficit. So if the government spends money and doesn't raise taxes in order to pay for that spending, there's an increase in the deficit. When there's an increase in the deficit, the government is, needs to borrow money, increase in the demand for credit. The government needs to borrow, so now it's demanding credit. All this demand for credit drives up the price of credit, which is the interest rate. I'll just put that I there. I've already sort of spelled out where I do it, changes in interest rates. So the government's borrowing more in order to finance the spending and driving up interest rates. And when the government drives up interest rates, then businesses say, gosh, we can't afford to invest as much in new plant and equipment. Interest costs are part of the expenses that we incur if we invest. And now with these higher interest rates, we can't afford to invest as much anymore. And by the way, the same thing happens for individuals. Let me do this here. Decrease in consumption spending. Maybe you were thinking about buying a new car or buying a house, and the interest rate was pretty low, it was 6% or whatever, and then all of a sudden, the government's borrowing more, driving up interest rates, and all of a sudden, the interest rate's 7%. And then you go down and you say, okay, I'm ready to borrow the money to buy that home. And they say, oh, by the way, since, uh, you know, last week when we first talked, interest rates have gone up from 6 to 7%. And then you say, gosh, I can't afford those house payments. Now, I just won't build a home. Or I'll build a smaller home. Whether you build a smaller home or no home, um, your consumption spending has gone down. And so, again, what's happened is the government spent more. It shifted the total expenditures curve up or increased aggregate demand. But the next step along the way is, Interest rates are driven up, investment spending down, consumption spending down, and it could be that we go all the way back to where we began with respect to total expenditures. How about this one? This is just a little bit more complicated, but it's based on the same idea. Another indirect crowding out. It operates through exchange rates. We start off the same way, increase in government spending with no changes in taxes, increase the deficit, which increases the government's demand for credit, 
this is a long one, which increases interest rates. We're only part way there. Interest rates are hard. Let me just kind of bring this one on back around. Interest rates are higher. So now, foreigners, in, uh, foreigners buy U.S. bonds and deposit money in U.S. banks. Why? Well, because we had these higher interest rates now. Our government's borrowing money, driving up interest rates. So foreigners want to put their money here. And when foreigners do that, you know, like if you're living in Japan or you're living in New York or, or uh, New York, you know, living in Mexico or living in uh, London and you want to put money in the United States, you don't just send your own like pesos or pounds, you have to send dollars. And so when foreigners want to put their money in the United States banks, that increases the demand for the dollar, foreign demand for the dollar which increases the exchange rate. Increase value of dollar. Boy, economists have to go a long ways in order to get to an answer, don't they? We're not there yet. So now the value of the dollar has gone up. Our government's borrowing. Interest rates are up. Foreigners start sending their money here. And to send money, they have to buy dollars first. So they've driven up the value of the dollar. The exchange rate's up. The dollar's strengthened. And so now, there's a decrease in XN net exports to the rest of the world. When our dollar becomes more valuable, that means our goods become more costly to foreigners. It means their goods become cheaper to us. So we don't sell so many goods to them, we buy more from them, and our net exports go down. So we're back to this story. The government spends more, total expenditures are up, but now because of this, uh, this uh, crowding out effect, and I'm saying in the foreign sector, net exports are going back down. Uh, this entry right here. And one final way, I'm going to have to, I guess I, eh, I better do it over here. Uh, one final indirect form of crowding out works like this. Increase in G with no change in T. So by the way, that's what we've assumed here the last three times is that it's not only government's spending more, but it's, it's running a deficit. If the government increases its spending with no increase in taxes, then that increases the national debt. Of course, there is a bigger deficit, but that, that adds to the national debt. And here's what people start thinking. This is US citizens. Increase in national debt, there will be an increase in future taxes. People start saying, well, the government's got a bigger debt, and they're going to have to tax us more in the future in order to pay that debt. And so then people start saying, man, if my future taxes are going to go up, I better start saving money, increase saving to pay taxes. I better be saving some more in order to pay my future tax bill. But you know, when people save more, that also means decrease in consumption spending. Those are the same thing. That is to say, the government spends more and run up the national debt. We start thinking, uh-oh, you know what that means. They can only spend this money for so long. Finally, they're going to come back and start taxing us to pay the interest and principal on the national debt. So my tax bill next year and 10 years from now and 50 years from now will be higher. And so I better get ready for higher taxes. So I'll save a little bit more. I'll spend a little bit less. A lot of crowding out, huh? So anyway, what we're saying here, and now we're really just to the second, there'll be one more item here, but what we're saying is, is that government spending goes up, and there are one, two, three, four different forms of crowding out that says once government spending went up, now there's a little bit of reduction in consumption spending, investment spending, net exports. And so what we can talk about is whether crowding out is complete, or incomplete.
Is it complete or is it incomplete? If crowding out is complete, here's what happens. Government spending goes up by whatever we said here, $18, then private spending goes down by $18. And if crowding out is complete, the multiplier equals zero. If crowding out is complete, every time the government puts another dollar into the economy, then the private sector takes it out, and I'm saying in terms of spending, private sector takes it out, and so we get no impact on the economy. If it's incomplete crowding out, then the multiplier is less than 1 over 1 minus the MPC, but it's still greater than zero. I don't know if I'm supposed to be making those uh, symbols go that way, but. The multiplier is still greater than zero, but it is less than, uh, how can I do this? I think I'm supposed to do it this way. There we go. I knew something went wrong there. The multiplier, if we have incomplete crowding out, I'm saying, then our multiplier, our real multiplier, is going to be less than its theoretical value and yet still positive. And that's probably the case, this incomplete crowding out. We could have zero crowding out where all these things are just nothing, but uh, I'm really not going to be telling you that story. Okay, one final thing that reduces the effectiveness of fiscal policy is lags. Lags. Lag, it takes time for things to happen. And there are five lags. Let me just kind of tick these off for you. We don't have to go through and talk about them in great detail. You can read about them in your textbook. But uh, there's a data lag. The data lag is, gosh, if we went into a recession, we don't know it overnight. It's not like somebody rings a bell and says, hey, a recession just started. We have to find that out by looking at the data, and the data is slow to come in, or are slow to come in. And so sometimes we don't find out about a recession or the end of a recession for several months. Let me remind you something that happened back in 1992. George Bush was president. He was running for re-election. Bill Clinton was running against him. He says, hey, the economy, Clinton says the economy is in a recession, been in a recession a long time. We need to do something to change this. George Bush says, oh, no, the economy is doing better than everybody thinks. And that was in 1992. Here's what happened. Uh, George Bush lost the election, of course, but in December of 1992, a committee that puts the date on recessions, a committee came out and said, the recession of 1990-91 ended back in uh, March of 1991, March of 1991. And so let me sort of tell you, here we are in December of 92, and we're saying that recession ended back in March. March was the last year of recession. April was the first year of recovery of 1991. That was a, more than a year and a half ago. So it took from April of 90, uh, March or April of 91 to December of 92 to figure out there was no recession. Well, if it takes you that long in order to get the data to say there's no recession, that means that for that next year and however many months it would be, eight months, the, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury and the Congress, they would all be fighting recession that didn't even exist. So there's a long lag just to get the data. A second lag, there's a wait and see lag. You know, just the first time you get a number that says recession could have started, you don't say, OK, let's change policy. What you say is, I wonder if that's just like a statistical uh, you know, sampling problem. I wonder if there's anything real there. You know, we better wait a few months and wait and see if anything new develops. If it looks like there's something really solid here, we'll take action. But we don't want to take action. All these numbers, and we've talked about them before, GDP and so forth, they come through sampling techniques. And so there could be sampling error. Or it could be that we just picked a few sectors to look at most closely, and they are having temporary downturns, a little bit of bad weather, or a strike, or something like that. And so since a little bad weather or a strike is going to pass, it's probably not a real problem. Problem. Let's wait and see what the data says in a month or two or three or four. So there's a data problem of it just takes time to get data. And then there's the I don't trust the data problem. It's the wait and see. I want to see some more results before I jump to conclusions. There's the legislative lag. You go to the Congress and you say, OK, Congress, I have studied this. The data is in. We have looked at it month after month. And there is a true problem. 
what we need to do is increase government spending in order to fight a recession. And the Congress says, okay, we'll do something. And what they mean by do something is we'll talk about it. We'll form some committees, we'll have some meetings, and then we'll get ready for the next election, and then we'll talk about something else, and then we'll come back and actually address this in a year or two. So there's a legislative lag. If the recession starts today, and you know it starts today, you tell the Congress, and they don't do anything today. They talk about it today. There's a transmission lag. After the Congress says, okay, let's act, let's do something then they start spending the money. Here's what happens. Let's say the Congress says, we're going to increase government purchases of goods and services in order to stimulate the economy. Let's build a highway. You know what they do? They don't just start building a highway that day. What they say is, we passed the law today to build a highway. Now what we're going to do is we're going to tell the Transportation Department to put out bids on this. And these bids, all these different contractors can come in and tell us how much they would pay or charge us in order to build this highway. And then after they have successfully, and this takes several months, submitted a bid and gotten the bid, then they go out and hire employees. They start getting their supplies together. They start showing, oh, there's a little bit of bad weather. Now they'll show up next month. The next month after they hired the employees, got all the supplies. And maybe there's another six months or a year burned up right there of just this whole transmission lag of transmitting this congressional law into actual dollars going into somebody's pocket. And then there's an effectiveness lag. Once the money's coming in, uh, let's say I'm the con uh, construction worker that's going to work on this new highway, and I start getting the money in my pocket, um, then I go out and spend it. But, you know, I don't spend it all in one day. I kind of wait a while. Maybe I say, gosh, I can be laid off at any time. Maybe I better save a lot of this. We'll see if this is a permanent job or just temporary. So there's, and then that multiplier effect that if I do spend the money, there's a multiplier effect, but not overnight. It takes a few weeks, a few months for this to happen, maybe a year or two. So what I'm telling you is, with the lags, you could have a problem start on January 1, 2000, and it might be, I don't, you, your guess is as good as mine to tell you the truth, it might be January 1, 2002 before something happens. And there could be a lag of a year or two very easily. And I'm not trying to tell you it's two years. I'm trying to tell you there's a long and variable, let's write it that way, long and variable lag between the onset of a problem and when we're actually doing something about it. So what does that mean? It means this. It means that there may no, no longer be a problem by the time you actually take action. You might say, if you're an economist or if you're in Congress, you might say, you know what we ought to do is just ignore this thing. This recession came along, probably by the time we can do anything, it'll be gone. The last recession the United States had, I shouldn't say the last, let's say the average recession is only going to be lasting about a year, year and a half. That's the average, year and a half. Well, if it takes you two years to do something, it's kind of late, isn't it? And so what I'm telling you is this is a real elegant theory about how the government can increase spending and increase uh, real GDP and solve all the world's problems. But there are some real world difficulties of making this stuff happen, and lags are one of those difficulties. Here's the problem that we have. Um, there's, let me write these up. There are two terms. One's countercyclical, counter -cyclical, one is pro-cyclical policy. Uh, and let me just kind of give you an idea. Here's time and real GDP. And what I'm saying is the economy goes through these cycles. We've already talked about the business cycle. If there's a counter-cyclical policy, and that's the desired one, that's what Keynes is talking about. If we have a counter-cyclical policy, we fight the business cycle. When the economy is strong, the government takes spending out. When the economy is weak, the government adds spending in. And so what we want to do is we want to make the, the peaks not so high, and we want to make the lows not so low. And there's still a little bit of a cycle there, but not as much of a cycle. Counter-cyclical, we're fighting the cycle. When the economy's strong, we want to weaken it. We want to raise taxes. We want to lower government spending. When the economy's weak, we want to stimulate it. We want to fight the cycle by increasing government spending and lowering taxes. That's the Keynesian policy. And I'm saying due to these lags, we may have a pro-cyclical policy. It may just be the case that when the economy's strong, we're giving it more money. 
And when the economy is weak, we're taking away. We're making the recessions deeper. We're making the peaks higher. This is not a good policy. In practice, the governments run, in, run up so much deficit, run up so much debt, I should say, and in practice, these lags are so severe, but that anymore, it's very difficult for the Congress to conduct fiscal policy. Even though we've got the Keynesian model of how it all was supposed to work, I'm saying it didn't work perfectly in the first place. We've got these first problems I've mentioned, but then with the lags and the deep financial difficulties that our Congress, or that our government's in, then basically the Congress doesn't do much of this anymore. Let's turn our attention to one final topic and then we will be done with this material on fiscal policy. And the final topic will be supply side fiscal policy. Supply side fiscal policy. All of the fiscal policy we've been talking about so far has been based on the idea of stimulating, or I should say changing, aggregate demand. Everything we've done up to now, has the idea is shift the aggregate demand curve. Me, um, how did we do this? Here's the, the aggregate supply curve that Keynes assumed. And all this stuff is shifting aggregate demand from AD1 to AD2 and so forth and then increasing real GDP, you get the idea. With supply side fiscal policy, the idea is, can we do something to help the economy on the supply side of the, uh, of the economy? And by that, I mean aggregate supply. I'm gonna draw this aggregate supply curve sloping upward, short run aggregate supply. Aggregate demand curve sloping downward. And I'm not going to change that aggregate demand curve right now. I'll just leave it alone. With supply side fiscal policy, we would say something like, hey, here's the equilibrium real GDP, but full employment is out here at some greater amount, QN, full employment GDP, natural real GDP. Okay, so what can we do to make that happen? And the answer is, well, if we wanted this real GDP and we're going to do it through the supply side of the economy, we need that aggregate supply curve to shift to the right. SRAS2. How can we do that? How about this? Uh, lower marginal tax rates. That's one way. And another way, deregulate the economy. And really, we mean companies to allow them to become more efficient. If you'll remember, our aggregate supply curve, just like our production possibilities frontier, been a while since you've seen that one, hasn't it? Production possibilities frontier. This production possibilities frontier, its position is based on how many resources we have available. And the idea is, if we will lower marginal tax rates, there will be more investment, so there will be more capital resources. There will be more people uh, wanting to work, so there will be more labor resources. And so by lowering marginal tax rates, we create incentives to work and invest. That shifts the aggregate, shifts the production possibilities frontier outward, but shifts the aggregate supply curve to the right. Deregulating the economy, basically what we do is we allow resources to be used more effectively. 
I think I told you the other day how we used to have regulations that said that a truck could deliver, and this is a semi-truck and so forth, could deliver products, this is back in the 60s and 70s, could deliver products but then had to go back empty to where it came from uh, and then pick up more goods, and, uh, goods to deliver someplace else. Well, once we deregulated that situation, trucking, they'd drive out with a load of uh, materials and then pick up some and bring them back. Okay, so those are supply side fiscal policies. Um, what we had, and by the way, an increase in aggregate, let me kind of draw this up here real quickly just to make a point. Here's short run aggregate supply. If we have an, an aggregate demand increase from AD1 to AD2, here's what we see. Yeah, real GDP rises, but we get inflation. There's kind of a trade-off. Do you want real GDP to go up and jobs to go up, or do you want inflation? And boy, we don't like that inflation, so there's kind of a trade-off. But here's the good news. If we are stimulating the economy, real GDP, by stimulating aggregate supply, the price level goes down. We don't have inflation. We had the opposite of, an, of inflation. So that's kind of good news in many people's books, is we're fighting inflation at the same time we're stimulating the economy. Okay, let me mention to you that back in the 1920s, 1960s, 1980s, in those three decades in, uh, in the 20th century, what we had was tax rate cuts, decrease in marginal tax rates. And by the way, let me just take one second to mention marginal tax rate, that term. What we mean is the percent of one more dollar of income that goes to taxes. And so what I mean is, some, with the marginal tax rate, I mean this. If my income went up by one more dollar and I paid 35 cents in taxes, 35 cents additional taxes, the marginal means incremental or additional, then I'd be in the 35 percent marginal tax bracket. Okay, but anyway, in the 20s and the 60s and in the 80s, we had marginal tax rates lowered significantly. And in all three of those decades, we experienced economic booms and declining inflation, which is exactly what this thing is telling us should happen, this diagram. If you can believe this, in 1961, I can't believe it even, in 1961 when JFK became president, the highest marginal tax rate was 91 percent. Can you believe that? You go to work, you earn $100, or you're an investor, you earn $100, you turn 91 over to the government, you keep nine. This is for people at the very highest level of income. And nine, uh, Kennedy lowered this, I think in 64, it was a Kennedy's proposed tax cut, lowered it to 70 percent. Reagan came to office in 1981 and then through 86, he did several things, and lowered this from 50 all the way down to 28 percent. Let me do one calculation for you to show you the importance of that. Let's say you've got one dollar's worth of income. In this case, you get to keep nine cents out of that dollar marginal dollars worth of income. Here, if you have another dollars worth of income, you get to keep 72 cents. The incentive is eight times as strong then under the Reagan tax policy as it had been prior to this uh, President Kennedy coming to office. Big change in incentives. Anyway, we will have an exam next time. It will cover this material on fiscal policy. So long. Well, hi. Um, I thought what we'd do for a few minutes here after class is talk about one more curve, um, something called the Laffer Curve. It's named after a person named Arthur Laffer. He's an economist at the University of Southern California. Uh, the way the story goes is back in the late 1970s, uh, Arthur Laffer was with a friend at dinner uh, sitting in a restaurant and pulled out a napkin and sketched a curve on it. And this curve became uh, pretty famous. It's not as well known today as it was back um, 10, 15 years ago. But nevertheless, there's some powerful ideas contained in this uh, curve that he drew. And so what we're going to talk about is something called the Laffer Curve. 
Um, let me sketch the curve out, and then we'll talk more about the whys and why nots and so forth of it. Uh, let's put along the horizontal axis here uh, the marginal tax rate. On the vertical axis, we'll write down total tax revenues. These are the total revenues collected by the government uh, from all taxpayers. This marginal tax rate, of course, is expressed as a percent uh, of income. Uh, and the Laffer curve uh, looks like this. It starts off at the zero point, and it goes up, and finally comes back down again. Uh, this is a zero percent tax rate, and what author Laffer said is this, is if the government charges a zero tax rate, zero percent, then of course it's going to collect zero revenues. Okay, And he also said if the government would charge a marginal tax rate, and that is to say just take 100 percent of any gain in income that a, a person earns, uh, then the government's tax revenues would again be zero dollars. And the reason for that is people don't work just so they can pay taxes. If there's nothing in it for them, uh, they don't work at all. And someplace in between, this is absolutely not supposed to be 50 percent, although it could be by accident, but someplace in between the zero and the 100 percent, there's a certain tax rate, and I'll put TM there, but there's a certain tax rate that maximizes uh, the government's revenues from uh, charging income taxes. And so uh, that was the simple idea behind the Laffer curve is just that um, uh, basically the government as it raises the tax rate starting at zero and five percent, 10, 15, 20 and so forth, as the government raises the tax rate, total revenues are rising. And so uh, there is a reward to the government or a, a payoff to the government from raising tax rates. On the other hand, according to Arthur Laffer, once you pass the magic point here that I've labeled as TM, then further increases in tax rates cause government revenues to go down. And why is this? Um, and Arthur Laffer said, you know, there's a number of reasons for it. Uh, there's two or three that are uh, best known. Uh, one is that as the tax rate goes up, the incentive to work and invest goes down. Okay, so a higher tax rate results in a, uh, uh, let me just write, decreases. Um, a higher tax rate lowers the incentive to work and invest. And so if we raise the tax rate beyond this, uh, this magic point here, or this uh, certain point, uh, then we've created disincentives for working and investing, and then people don't pay taxes. Let's write down a formula, and then uh, maybe this will be a little easier to understand. Total tax revenues, this is the T that we've got up here, the dollar amount. Total tax revenues equal the tax rate times the tax base. Okay, this is a percent, the tax rate, and the tax base is a number of dollars. It's the thing being taxed, such as your income. And so basically, uh, the Arthur Laffer story is that um, as we start increasing the tax rate, the tax base, there's a disincentive to earning income. And so the tax base goes down. These two things are happening all the time. Um, and many economists, including Laffer, they call this the arithmetic effect of a tax rate increase. That is to say, if the tax base were to stay the same and the tax rate goes up, then tax revenues would definitely have to go up. Let me get rid of this decrease here. Just simple arithmetic tells us that. If the tax base is, let's say, $10,000, and we're taxing that at a 10% rate, then tax revenues are going to be $1,000. And then if, on the other hand, this tax rate is raised to 20%, and if the tax base remains at uh, $10,000, government revenues must go up to $2,000. Okay, and so there's the arithmetic effect. Simple arithmetic tells us higher tax rate higher tax revenues. There's something else, though, called the incentive effect, or you could say the economic effect. Uh, and the incentive effect says this. As the tax rate goes up and the government's taking a larger percent of our, uh, of our earnings as 
taxes, then there's this disincentive uh, about working and investing. And by the way, there are other incentives that are created as well. We've all heard of tax loopholes, and uh, if the tax rate goes up, it creates an incentive to basically find those loopholes, the higher experts that can help us uh, do that. There's um, other incentives, for example, the incentive to invest overseas. Uh, you're still investing just as much, but maybe not in this country. Um, there's the incentive to change the types of investments that we make. Buy some municipal bonds where we don't have to pay income taxes on our interest income, as opposed to buying, let's say, corporate bonds or government bonds, mm, treasury bonds, or uh, corporate stocks. And so a lot of incentives are created, but the point is they all go in the same direction. That is to say, a higher tax rate causes the tax base to shrink. And that's the incentive effect. And that shrinking tax base, that causes tax revenues to go down, other things being equal. And so really what the Arthur Laffer story is, and by the way, before I go on to Arthur Laffer, let me redo this and put in the incentive effect. What we're saying is this, is if the tax rate goes up to 20%, then the tax base is going to go down, and I'll just use a hypothetical number here, let's say to $8,000, and so now government revenues in this particular case would be $1,600. The government, its revenues would double because of the arithmetic effect, but because 20% uh, of the tax base has been eliminated um, due to the incentive effect, then what the, the government gets is just this 60% increase in its revenues. So anyway, these two things are, are working on the opposite direction. Now back to the Laffer curve. Really what we're saying is this, is up to this peak on the Laffer curve, the arithmetic effect is the stronger effect, that is to say a higher tax rate. We're, we're destroying incentives as we raise the rate, but we're just doing that at a very slow pace. Let me uh, change the size of my arrows to sort of indicate where we are. As we move up this Laffer curve, the tax rate rises and the tax base shrinks, but just a little bit. And since the rate goes up by a bigger percentage than the base shrinks, total revenues rise. Then we finally reach a certain point, and beyond that, further increases in the tax rate cause the tax base to shrink by a lot due to this incentive effect. And so again, just showing the magnitudes with arrows, we raise the rate some more. The base shrinks by a lot, and so now tax revenues begin to, to decline, and of course all the way down to uh, zero. Now. This was a, a big part of the story. This, by the way, this is really just supply-side economics, uh, which we talked about in class uh, earlier. Uh, supply-side economics says that if the tax rate goes up, we'll put real GDP here in the price level, the uh, what uh, short-run aggregate supply curve. What we said before was a higher tax rate shifts this curve to the left. We have a, a smaller aggregate supply curve or a decreased aggregate supply. And that's all we're saying here is that the tax base is shrinking. So we've got uh, that story, and I'm saying that when Arthur Laffer was doing his work talking about taxes, um, that was uh, an important period for supply-side economics. That's when uh, the campaign of, what was it, 1980 with Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter, that turned to uh, a lot of discussion about taxes and the effect on the economy. And Reagan at the time was arguing for cutting the tax rate. And um, what he was saying is that that would make the economy stronger. Now, at the same time Reagan was saying cut the tax rate will make the economy stronger, other economists, including Arthur Laffer, they were coming along and saying, well, not only will the economy get stronger if we cut this tax rate, but also tax revenues will go up. Uh, let's cut the rate a little bit. And they were saying the base will grow so much that tax revenues will rise. And so if they believe that, here's what they thought. They thought, well, we're at a certain point like right here. Here's the tax rate. I'm getting kind of a ugly picture here, but uh, he was saying something like our tax rate is, is pretty high. Let's say here's uh, 1980, and the idea is if you cut the tax rate back to here, a much smaller rate, then what will happen is the arithmetic effect will cause the government to lose revenues, but the tax base will grow, and so government revenues will actually rise and become a larger amount. So anyway, um, President or candidate Reagan ran for office, was successful in his first uh, year of office. Um, he promoted, um, advocated, and argued for, and finally received um, uh, across the board tax cuts, so tax rates did go down. And here's what we observed. 
We observed that there were some Americans, when their tax rate went down, some Americans actually did pay less to the government in the form of revenues. Okay, their total tax bill fell because for some Americans, the arithmetic effect was strong and they just, the lower rate, the, they paid less revenue. But for other Americans, um, when the tax rate was cut, they paid more to the government. And as it turns out, and we have seen this over and over, 1920s, 1960s, 1980s, in each one of those decades when we had tax rate cuts, what we observe is exactly this, is that there's a certain segment of the public that does pay lower tax, taxes in total, dollar amount, to the government when their rates are cut. And there's a different segment of the population that when their rates are cut, they pay more to the government. And as it turns out, these tend to be low, lower income people and the people who respond by paying more taxes to the government when their rates are cut, they tend to have higher incomes. Now, why is that? And the answer is kind of simple. The people with lower incomes basically have less investment income, less opportunity to shift their investments from, let's say, uh, what corporate bonds into municipal bonds, less opportunity to go overseas with their investments and that type of thing. And they've got a job that's maybe a fixed number of hours a week. They have very little control over their schedule. And so for many people, um, when their tax rate goes down, there is no change in the base they just keep on earning the same amount of income. But for other people who have more control over their incomes uh, and where they invest and so forth, when their tax rate goes down, they do tend to invest more, work more, put more in the United States, and so they do pay more in revenue. And so we've observed exactly that same thing throughout, uh, or in each one of these decades when we had major tax cuts, uh, and observed not only this in, what, the 1981 tax cuts, but then later on we had a second round of tax cuts in 1986, and same thing then. And so uh, anyway, the Laffer curve is, uh, contains a lot of powerful ideas. The key idea is for us to understand this. It's, we don't know what this rate is uh, where we, the government maximizes its revenues. That will change from one year to the next. And so I don't want to tell you that there's a fixed rate. What I do want to tell you is this, is that there's always some incentive effect. There's always uh, some impact on the tax base when the government changes its rates. And the fact that there is this incentive effect means that the government can go overboards, it can be raising rates to too high of a level, in which case it harms the economy and it also hurts the government's revenues. Um, anyway, why don't you practice with this a little bit and we'll um, talk more about it later on. So long.